Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. It's, uh, it's my true pleasure for us to have Dr. Donald Mabbitt uh, joining us to speak to us about the role of a psychologist uh, on a neuro pediatric neuro-oncology program, uh, as well as uh, integrating knowledge across different uh, model systems to help us better understand neuroplasticity in a developing system. Uh, for those of you that don't know Don, he received his PhD in developmental psych at the University of Alberta in 1998 and then did a postdoctoral fellowship in pediatric neuropsychology at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, Don is the head of neuroscience and mental health program and the senior, senior scientist within the research institute at Sick Kids, as well as a professor of the department uh, in the Department of Psychology at U of T. Uh, he, his work is situated at the intersection between clinical neuroscience, developmental neuropsychology, and regenerative medicine. Uh, Don's research program seeks to understand how um, perturbed brain development manifests as cognitive impairment in children, particularly in survivors of pediatric brain tumors, and discover how neuroplasticity in the developing brain can be harnessed for neural recovery and cognitive restoration in children with ABI. His work has been instrumental in documenting the thinking and learning problems children uh, and adolescents uh, with brain tumors experience and the underlying damage to brain structure and function that caused these problems. Uh, he's now doing exciting new work to find ways to foster brain repair and cognitive recovery following ABI in children, including harnessing neuroplasticity from physical exercise and employing drugs that stimulate the growth of new brain cells. Uh, and it's a personal pleasure to have Don here because uh, in my role as co-site lead of the CCHCSP, I can tell you firsthand that, um, you know, as, as you all know, it's so important early in your careers to be surrounded by strong mentors that encourage you to pursue your dreams. And, uh, and uh, Dawn was instrumental in that role when we were colleagues together on the neuro-oncology program at SickKids. So uh, Dawn, I really thank you for that early support. And that's what we're trying to achieve here with the CCHCSP. Uh, is, is access to those types of, uh, of mentors. And so it's, it's a real pleasure and, um, uh, for us to have you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, I see some familiar names um, and uh, faces. I saw Janice uh, jump on for a quick minute there. Hi, Janice. Um, I'm certainly uh, keen to have a I'm not sure the format of, of um, presentations that you that you typically do, but I'm certainly keen for this to be a discussion um, and for people to jump in at any time. Um, well, what I've done is I've kind of combined uh, some content about the the research coming out of my lab, but combine that with kind of highlighting the disciplines, the different disciplines that are, are needed and, and important in the work that, that, um, that I'm doing. And I think quite frankly, that are essential to all uh, research, uh, health, particularly health research. Uh, um, I think we're at a place and a time in health research where the fundamental, um, questions that we need to ask the, uh, and um, implement are, can't be done by a single scientist. It, it, um, it requires team science. It requires uh, scientists from different backgrounds, from medicine, from rehab, from nursing, uh, fundamental basic science. Um, and uh, I hope that comes out in my presentation. Uh, and I'm keen for folks to um, uh, raise any questions or, or comments at any time. Um, it might be helpful for me just, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but just what's the span of disciplines that um, are represented uh, today? Maybe if people just want to type in the chat, uh, so I, we, we don't take up time. If you could kind of just uh, uh, um, Give me a, a quick note in the chat in terms of the discipline background that you're coming from. Uh, that would be helpful uh, as I go along. Okay, I'm seeing already speech language, pathologist, pharmacology. Uh, Physio's there. Social work, developmental, pediatric immunology. So yeah, so this is a really um, a diverse uh, a group of individuals representing 
um, uh, medicine. Uh, uh, this is just like, oh, I feel so much at home. <laughs> I love this. Uh, I love these types of group. I, I, and I knew that would be the case given the uh, content of this program, but uh, to have representation from, um, you know, multiple disciplines um, across the health spectrum uh, is great. Um, so I'm going to share my slides and I'm going to get started. And um, please uh, jump in with any questions uh, or comments uh, at any time. I'm, I will try to monitor uh, the chat that, or, or, or the hand, hand raising may be a bit hard because I only have a few um, images up. Um, we'll be here, Don, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat box for you. Okay, that's that's good. And yeah, so feel feel free to jump in at any time. Um, we have 50 minutes uh, and we'll, we'll go ahead. So really what I was uh, asked by uh, Annie Wang, another friend uh, and colleague from our brain tumor days, um, to speak about today was uh, transversing and integrating across levels of analysis, models and disciplines in research. Um, and I'm gonna focus specifically on reducing cognitive late effects in pediatric brain tumors. Um, so I hope what you take from this talk today is how a psychologist, which is what, what I am, works with oncologists, neurobiologists, radiologists, radiation oncologists, nursing, physiotherapy in a research program. And uh, that research, the context that I'm gonna describe to you is, is, a, is a research program um, where we're working to harness neuroplasticity for cognitive recovery and brain repair in survivors of pediatric brain tumors. Uh, and I'll quickly highlight the impact of brain tumors and their treatment on the neuro, on neuropsychological aid effects. Uh, I'll talk about, you know, some fundamental understanding of harnessing neuroplasticity for recovery and repair. And then I'll give uh, um, some examples of our work um, for repairing the brain with a particular focus on repurposing the drug metformin for cognitive restoration and brain growth. Throughout, what I hope I will be doing is highlighting the value of research that spans and integrates levels of analysis and different model systems and different disciplines to understand neuroplasticity. So the big picture that I think is not news to anybody on this call is there's been a revolution in pediatric healthcare and in our lifespan. Well, and I think some of our lifespans are longer than others, but certainly in the 57, no, oh, 53, 53 years, what am I thinking 57? The 53 years that I've been alive, um, I guess aging's catching up on me. The 50 year, 53 years uh, in my life uh, span, there's been a revolution in um, pediatric health. And you can see that represented on these two slides. On the left-hand side, uh, the slide depicting uh, these are data from the States, but it's similar for Canada, decreases in infant mortality rate, and neonatality mortality rate from the 50s into the 2010s. Things have actually plateaued somewhat, I would say, since that time. And likewise, if we look specifically at cancer on the right-hand side, you see um, uh, a decrease in mortality rate and an increase in averted deaths uh, in the last uh, more 30, 40 odd years or so. Uh, and again, I would say things have kind of plateaued uh, um, since the, the 2010s. Um, but this represents, uh, you know, this revolution that uh, most pediatric health conditions are chronic health conditions rather than uh, acute life-taking conditions. That still certainly is a significant portion, but because of the advances in treatment, because of the advances in our ability to uh, save children's lives, most uh, pediatric health conditions, uh, I think, can be characterized as chronic health conditions. And this is particularly true for pediatric brain tumors, um, particularly medulloblastoma. So, uh, medulloblastoma is the most common malignant brain, brain tumor. It's fairly rare, fortunately, about a thousand new cases in the world uh, each year. It's the second, uh, well, tumors in general, CNS tumors are the second most common uh, tumor cancer um, after leukemia. Um, 
And here's a, 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 an MRI scan. So this is a, a, a sagittal image. So here's the nose of, of the child and here's the back of the brain. And here you can appreciate the uh, brain tumor in the posterior fossa. Here's a coronal section. So now we're kind of uh, going across the brain. Um, the nose is at the front here now and the back of the brain is here. And you can appreciate the medulloblastoma sitting in the posterior fossa, the cerebellum of the brain, which is the typical location of these brain tumors. Um, just so you're, just so you know, your mouse is not showing on our our screen. Oh, okay. Uh, so just so you're aware, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to point with my finger, but that won't uh, work either. So I will use descriptive language. Thanks, dear. Um, hopefully, uh, everybody got a sense of what I was describing. So if we think about the impact of tumor and treatment, uh, um, really, I think there's a cascade of injury to the healthy brain um, uh, as a consequence of the curative therapies that we have used to uh, yield these dramatic increases in survival in brain tumors in the past 50 years. Certainly the tumor itself uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, and you can see again an image with the tumor in the posterior fossa there, has effects on uh, um, healthy brain structure and function. Surgery, as you can see in the middle, uh, an image uh, thanks to my friend and colleague, uh, Michael Taylor, um, where you can see surgery has a, an impact in terms of acquired injury and neuroinflammation. Radiation, you'll see in the middle uh, to the right there, uh, again has a cascade of cellular and microenvironment um, impacts on the developing brain. And also chemotherapy, um, we know, particularly uh, autotoxicity, uh, results in disrupted brain function and cognitive impairment in these um, uh, children. Um, now, there has been significant advances in brain tumor treatment for reducing the impact uh, of uh, um, radiation, in, particularly on the healthy brain and reducing light effects. And so here's my first shout out to radiation oncologists and the advances in, in um, radiation oncology and radiation physics that have allowed for the sparing of tissue. So um, medulloblastoma is treated with surgery, chemotherapy, uh, radiation um, with a five-year survival rate around 70%. I think it's probably increased to 80% now, but uh, that is because of the uh, uh, treatment with curative radiation. So um, in typical traditional uh, radiation uh, protocols, aggressive disease is treated with uh, whole brain radiation to a dose of 3600 centigrade, and then a boost to the posterior fossa that I noted to you, that's that area of the back of the brain, um, up to a total dose of, of 5,400 centigrade of radiation. If there was less aggressive disease, so this is disease that there's less evidence of metastases and other markers, that uh, dose to the entire brain is more like 2,300 centigrade, but there's still a boost to the posterior fossa. Since 1997, um, here in, in um, Toronto and, and in many areas, that boost, rather than being to the posterior fossa, has been just to the tumor bed, as you see on the very far right of the screen. And this had a dramatic impact, I think, in sparing much tissue, because when you deliver a, a tumor bed boost, you're actually reducing the amount of radiation to the broad areas of the brain, like the temporal lobe. Um, and, and this has had significant impacts for uh, intellectual function. So if you look on the left-hand side, uh, this is some work that I did when I first started <coughs> at SickKids uh, with Brenda Spiegler, another psychologist, as well as Eric Buffet, a, a neuro-oncologist, as well as Norm LaPerriere, a radiation oncologist, uh, where we documented um, declines in uh, IQ, in, in intellectual functioning over time in children treated for medulloblastoma with uh, radiation. And you can appreciate that uh, there were significant declines up to one to two. So each of those lines represents a single individual uh, and each dot represents a time point uh, of assessment. And, and that's quite a depressing um, graph that you can see on the left-hand side in terms of the effects of radiation on intellectual function. 
intellectual function, having a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of uh, 15, you can see uh, much of the scores is heading in the wrong direction. But if uh, you, we fast forward now to about 10 years later, when now we started looking at the difference between children who had reduced dose uh, tumor bed. So I will direct you back to this slide. That's these less aggressive diseases treated with just the tumor bed dose versus all the other uh, protocols you see now evidence of intellectual sparing in that red line. And that was a significant difference in terms of uh, slope as well as uh, group means in children who were treated. This is a trajectory again. This is essentially the data. Uh, we, we took the same data approaches on the left-hand side, um, but now these lines represent a group uh, a mean a trend lines as opposed to individual lines. But you can really appreciate the sparing of intellectual function in children treated with a uh, tissue sparing reduced dose tumor bed. Um, and, and the latest, uh, I think, um, uh, novel approach to uh, treatment that will spare tissue is the use of proton radiation. Um, and proton radiation. Uh, just by the nature of the biophysics that I won't get into today, but I will again highlight the, the role of radiation physicists in uh, this therapy, um, is proton radiation deposits a fewer, uh, less radiation dose uh, to tissue than a photon radiation, which is the standard modality that I just described about. Um, we don't have protons in Canada right now, but we established a unique partnership with colleagues at um, uh, Texas Children's Hospital in um, Houston, where they do treat children with protons, to look at um, the differences between proton versus photon radiation. We matched our samples on education, tumor, uh, and treatment protocol. And this is really about the only way we can make this analysis, because given the the known and suspected benefits of protons, doing a randomized controlled trial um, just is not feasible. So uh, we leverage this unique partnership to compare proton versus photon radiation. This gives you a real example of the benefits of photon versus proton radiation. And this was a data provided by, and an image provided by David Groshans, who's a radiation oncologist at MD Anderson. And the colored areas represent radiation dose uh, and the percentage of radiation dose. And you can see in photon radiation, this tumor bed boost that you see uh, targeted at the back of the brain, the bright spot, still delivers radiation to the rest of the brain. Uh, whereas photon radiation really is able to target it very specifically to the posterior fossa. So there's a tissue sparing approaches that have resulted in um, sparing even more so of intellectual function. So the blue line, again, is a trend line for all the children we saw uh, longitudinal data uh, in IQ uh, treated with protons. And you can see now there's actually a stable IQ in children treated with radiation for medulloblastoma, which is quite dramatic. Uh, whereas those treated with protons are XRT, X-ray radiation, that's what the X is for. There's continues to be a clines, declines in, in um, IQ. But the, the, um, uh, this is particularly apparent in um, measures of working memory, the ability to hold and manipulate uh, uh, information in memory. So if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, you see, again, that difference in uh, uh, trajectory of working memory scores uh, in proton versus photon treated children. But when we get to processing speed, the speed at which um, children can complete tasks and engage in thinking uh, skills, there is no difference and there continues to be decline. So while we've made advances uh, uh, through uh, multidisciplinary research in sparing cognition um, uh, by applying proton radiation, uh, there are, remain specific cognitive late effects that uh, we have to find other uh, approaches uh, to mitigate. Um, and uh, huh. My background slides didn't come up for this one, but what I, why I wanted to highlight this is, um, this is um, diffusion tensor imaging showing the white matter damage uh, uh, to the brain in children treated only with 
surgery. So these are children treated for brain tumors with surgery only. And all the areas of green that you see uh, are kind of core tracts of white matter. Overlaid on those areas are areas of difference in various uh, diffusion measures of white matter microstructure. I won't go into the specific indices. There are fractional anisotrophy in red, radial diffusivity in blue, and um, um, magnetization transfer imaging uh, in yellow, which is a different modality than diffusion tensor imaging. But it gives you the sense that even in the absence of radiation, there's widespread white matter compromise in white matter. Um, and so we need to find new ways to help uh, rescue or repair tissue, even in the absence of uh, toxic therapies like chemotherapy and radiation. We also see reduced hippocampal volume in this case, these are children treated with radiation. So on the left, I'm showing you a slide uh, of the uh, hippocampus, which is outlined. Uh, you can see it in the inset in the sagittal plane at the top, in the axial, um, uh, sorry, in the coronal plane in the middle and the axial plane at the bottom, um, uh, where you can see uh, the hippocampus. We segmented that and then we looked at it simply the volume of various subfields of the, of the um, hippocampus and saw that it's reduced in children treated for brain tumors. So uh, not only are these cognitive late effects, but we continue to see uh, compromise in, in, in brain structure and brain tissue as a consequence of uh, radiation, uh, as well as uh, simply by the presence of a tumor itself. And so I just wanna pause here to, to highlight all the disciplines that are needed to do this work that I've just described. So certainly uh, psychology and cognitive science are needed to understand cognition and brain development. But without the neuro-oncology expertise, understanding the brain tumor and the multimodal treatment that's used uh, to treat brain tumors and the pathophysiology um, that's associated with brain tumor treatment, um, this work uh, has, uh, is divorced from the, the, the direct application to uh, patients. A radiation oncology we need for understanding radi radiation dosimetry and therapy. Um, I didn't talk about this work, but uh, some of the new work that we're doing um, uh, with our colleagues in Texas is looking at symptom burden um, uh, and the differences in symptom burden between proton and photon radiation. And there, uh, our nursing colleagues, uh, in this case, it's Pam Hines at Children's National are, is key. And certainly biomedical engineering and physics in terms of understanding uh, imaging and radiation is all key. When we start to expand our understanding of um, um, late effects to a broader and more specific measures um, than IQ, things like speak, speech and language. Um, Derek knows this well because that's uh, where he did a lot of work. We need speech and language pathology, part particularly for the impact of mutism. Um, uh, in a moment, you'll see the work that I'm doing where uh, rehab uh, therapy is key. So um, just this sense that not only in the care of children, but in the research to understand illnesses and disease and the impact and injury, uh, we need to be able to transverse uh, across disciplines. Uh, and I'm gonna switch gears a bit in, in including in this, uh, this multidisciplinary approach uh, um, and this uh, ability to traverse uh, is a, a fundamental understanding of how uh, the neurobiology of the brain, you know, and take whatever tissue um, or whatever area that you work in and, and apply the same, but we're focused on the brain today. And I think we're in the um, uh, early part of a, of a second paradigm shift or a second revolution in, revolution in pediatric healthcare. And that is starting to understand uh, plasticity, particularly in my case, brain plasticity, and, and harnessing that for repair. Um, and uh, I just want to quickly highlight some of the, you know, what I mean by plasticity so that we're all on the same page. Um, by plasticity, I'm talking about, well, if you look it up in the dictionary, you'll see terms like malleability, being easily shaped or molded, uh, undergoing permanent deformation under load, which is one of my 
favorite ones because it's from engineering. My son's an engineer. Uh, another good one is bendy and stretchy. Um, so how do we apply that uh, when we're understanding the brain? Well, so I characterize neuroplasticity as a process in, in which brain structure and function is altered either as an effect of some biological determinant, uh, following insult, or from some micro or macro macro environmental change. So this is like activity dependent plasticity or enriched environment. Um, so uh, at a cellular level, we can talk about things like um, increases in uh, um, synaptic uh, connections. We can talk about uh, uh, synaptic plasticity uh, themselves in terms of uh, axon terminals. Well, we can talk about neurogenesis, um, uh, the growth of new cells, and we can talk about myelination, the, 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 the wrapping of the axons with uh, white matter in order to increase signal, conduct, signal conduction. And these are all examples of cellular mechanisms of neuroplasticity. Um, one area that I've started to focus on is uh, the role of stem cells in the brain uh, for neuroplasticity. So these, we call them stem cells, but really once they are uh, um, uh, in the brain, um, we call them neural precursor cells, but they reside in the subventricular zone in the, uh, uh, um, of the uh, ventricles. Um, and these are uh, immature cells that can um, grow and differentiate into healthy neurons or healthy glial cells, healthy white matter cells. The other known area is the um, subcortical white matter, um, as well as the dentate gyrus. You see this on the bottom, uh, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus where neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons, and you can uh, kind of see that schematic on the very uh, bottom right-hand side, uh, uh, is uh, on, with that square down in the, in the bottom um, uh, to the right uh, is a schematic of neurogenesis in the hippocampus is associated with memory and learning. Uh, and we know that there's greater plasticity in the neural precursor cells in children than there are in adults, but it's likely a process that exists throughout the lifespan. And Here's where my colleagues in neurobiology, so this is Frida Middler on the top and her uh, a colleague and, and husband, David Kaplan, who really um, kind of, I think, formalized this idea of, of um, inducing endogenous repair mechanisms um, to foster uh, brain repair. And the idea really was, could we use novel therapeutics um, or repurpose therapeutics that you'll see in a moment um, that activate specific uh, cellular mechanisms or even subcellular mechanisms to initiate stem cell expansion, migration, and differentiation. We can also consider activity-dependent plasticity. So just things like um, exercise that you'll see in a moment or other areas that change the brain in the same way that uh, stimulate stem cell expansion, migration, and differentiation. So the key role of neurobiology in uh, late effects of children. And Frida applied this model, uh, this idea, to uh, um, the drug metformin. Uh, she used metformin um, in she learned about metformin from a, a colleague who studies um, diabetes, actually, because we know that metformin is used in that population and the impact um, uh, on insulin receptors um, and stem cells there. Um, and she uh, f demonstrated that in the brain, metformin activates a particular pathway, the atypical PKC CBP pathway, and it promotes neurogenesis and enhanced memory formation. So she took like a transgenic mouse model that's depicted in that little mouse there with the little genetic code on it. Uh, and this mouse model is, 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 is designed so that you can label uh, uh, neural precursor cells uh, and uh, and then after the treatment of, of metformin, these label cells can be traced. So you can see them uh, grow over time. And so on the, the 
below the mouse on the left hand side you see a, a control sample where all those little green dots are neural precursor cells and in the metformin condition these are mice treated with metformin you see after a period of time many more little green dots or many more neural precursor cells and on the very bottom on the left you see now those cells have differentiated into neurons and you see many more neurons in the metformin than the control condition and these are neurons in the hippocampus and these uh, neurons are also associated with uh, enhanced spatial memory for memory formation and this was work that paul franklin um a what we like to call him our mouse neuropsychologist he's a basic uh, um, um, memory researcher and from a psychology background uh, he conducted these animal studies to to demonstrate the the enhanced spatial memory formation um uh, my other colleague, Cindy Morse, had another stem cell biologist, applied metformin in the context of a, a, a childhood brain injury in uh, mice. This was a hypoxia ischemia injury. And uh, essentially what she showed is uh, there was a recovery. If you give metformin to, you know, mouse pups, you see up at the top there, and then you assess mice over time. Um, and then you do what's called a neurosphere assay um, across different mice at different time points uh, and count the number of stem cells that come from, uh, in this case, it was a, the corpus callosum. You can see after treatment with metformin, that very dark bar, uh, um, there's many more um, new uh, oligodendrocyte cells uh, following uh, treatment with metformin. And so there's a rescue of these cells. And if you look at the um, that cylinder test in the middle, this is a, a functional assay looking at motor function in uh, uh, mice after this hypoxic injury. And after the injury, essentially they're given a hemiparesis and they can only use one paw and they put them in a cylinder to explore that and they're only using one paw. And you can see that uh, in terms of the non-impaired four-paw preference in that middle uh, graph, after the injury, they use that non-impaired four-paw much, much more compared to the control uh, and the metformin-only condition without an injury. If you give metformin to the uh, uh, mice with injury, that that uh, motor function is, is rescued. And so this really uh, made us think, well, can we use metformin in the context of children's uh, cognitive late effects from uh, brain tumor treatment? And, and so I worked with uh, um, Cindy uh, as well as Frida uh, in a parallel animal and human study. Uh, where uh, we asked whether metformin can repair the brain and foster cognitive recovery in parallel mouse and human studies of radiation injury. So uh, Cindy led the mouse model uh, portion of, of the study, uh, a mouse model of cranial radiation, and I led a, placebo, a pilot placebo-controlled double-blind crossover trial of metformin for brain repair in children treated with cranial spinal radiation. And really this was a feasibility trial to uh, help us to design a future um, phase three trial. And so here's Cindy's data. Again, she used that transgenic mouse model um, where you can label the uh, tag essentially neural precursor cells based on genetic modifications in these mice. Uh, uh, and she treated these mice with radiation. And then you'll see at the top panel, um, they were treated with radiation uh, as pups. Some mice then, she did a, a neurosphere assay where she essentially uh, collected stem cells from different regions of the brain in these mice. And then uh, a certain portion of, of the uh, um, mice that weren't sacrificed for the neurosphere assay were treated with metformin uh, and then had cognitive testing. And then she did uh, that neurosphere assay again. And you can see in the staining there, um, down immediately below the cranial, sorry, the control mice, the, the, the IR radiated mice, and the um, uh, mice treated with metformin. Um, on the top, you see the labeling of uh, the number of neural precursor cells. And I'll draw your attention to the middle panel, the IR panel on the top. They're just blown away. The, the, the precursor cells are blown away by radiation. And that's a, an example of radiation injury that I did talked about earlier. 
but metformin rescues the a number of precursor cells. And in the, the uh, bottom panel, the, the DAPI uh, panel that looks at dividing cells, you see that these cells are proliferating uh, much more uh, following metformin rescue. We, uh, Cindy also did cognitive testing on the mice again using uh, a, a working memory uh, paradigm in mice, which is the Y maze, and you see that on the bottom left hand side, uh, where a, a little treat has put on one arm of a Y maze, either the N or the O, uh, and the, then uh, the mouse is allowed to explore that maze and find the treat, and then you take the treat away, and uh, then they explore it again, and learning occurs when they go to the arm where the treat originally was. And she found some really unique findings here that we saw rescue of working memory, and this is the, 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 the left-hand panel where we say female, uh, where uh, uh, working memory was reduced uh, in radiated uh, mice uh, in the middle uh, bar, but metformin rescued um, uh, working memory performance in female mice. We did not see the same effects in male mice, which is, I think, a very important um, uh, animal finding that we need to take forward to clinical studies. But this really is, you know, uh, was very interesting for us for establishing the mechanistic basis of metformin um, for cognitive recovery in an animal model, which I think uh, is a key principle that helps to guide our future clinical studies. Uh, and that's what we did with um, Rami Ayoub on the left, who was a graduate student in my lab at the time, and Eric Buffet, uh, a neuro-oncologist, uh, a good friend and uh, uh, a mentor uh, for me uh, for many years at the Hospital for Sick Children, where we used metformin and we could use it um, I thought I saw pharmacolo uh, pharmacology uh, discipline was represented today, so they'll know this. Um, uh, metformin is a well-known and used drug for diabetes. Um, it's been used since 1959, and it's been used in children as young as, as two years of age uh, for metabolic disorders, uh, uh, but primarily in diabetes. There's also a literature uh, suggesting it has promise for enhancing cognition in adults, likely because of the mechanisms that Frida already demonstrated. So our goal here in this uh, parallel uh, pilot study was to use findings to design an adequately powered multicenter prospective clinical trial to test optimal treatment delivery of metformin. And so our goals were uh, to look at uh, the safety profile in this population and also to target specific uh, cognitive outcomes that where we could potentially detect a signal to carry forward to a, a phase three um, uh, trial. This is our trial design. I'm just gonna draw your attention to a few points here. On the left, you'll see we assessed 130 patients for eligibility, but ultimately only 24 patients were randomized, um, uh, which is a, um, a uh, recruitment rate of somewhat less than 20%. Um, which is uh, we thought was low, but it actually tip, is, is, is pretty typical for these kinds of neural rehab types of studies. We used a crossover design. And so that's the other thing I'll draw your attention to where uh, half the group uh, was given metformin and then there was a 10 week washout and then they were given placebo. And then the other half uh, had the reverse sequence. Uh, and this was a, they were, uh, this was a double blind um, placebo controlled uh, trial. Um, um, and then I'm going to uh, highlight the outcomes that we looked at. So we looked at safety and feasibility outcomes. You see there cognitive outcomes with a particular focus on memory and working memory because of the animal literature. Uh, we also looked at attention and processing speed because these are known late effects of cognitive uh, uh, cognitive late effects of radiation therapy. And we looked at uh, MRI outcomes. We looked at diffusion imaging in the white matter of the corpus callosum. And we looked at blood flow in the hippocampus, those little green dots you see on that uh, uh, colored image, arterial spin label imaging. We looked at blood flow as a surrogate for angiogenesis, which is a surrogate for, we thought, uh, hip, uh, neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So, 
uh, here's our sample in terms of the characteristics in the two groups. There were some kind of baseline differences in uh, the groups in the different sequence conditions in terms of radiation therapy and, and some of the late effects, uh, pardon me, the um, uh, residual effects uh, and post-operative effects um, in, uh, in terms of uh, cerebellar signs, hemiparesis, and mutism. Um, this is our analytic plan. I'm going to jump over that. We can go back to that if you're interested. Um, so the first thing we identified was that metformin is safe and feasible to use in survivors of pediatric brain tumors. So each of these squares represent uh, the, the, the one specific adverse event that was noted in a patient. Um, and the colors represent the same patient as you move down the line, as you move down the line vertically. Um, and so you can see uh, the primary adverse events that we recorded were all mild um, and they were all GI related, which is what we would have expected uh, because those are the, the typical adverse events associated with metformin. But none of them were to the extent that anybody um, discontinued the trial. And in fact, you'll see uh, uh, we saw greater frequency of GI uh, uh, AEs in the placebo con condition as well. So that was um, um, interesting. We did this some of this over the winter a few years ago, and we thought it, you know, maybe it was related to the flu in, in, in some of the kids. Um, uh, but we found it was safe and feasible. We did uh, um, various blood markers as well, and, and all of those d uh, showed no uh, uh, severe AEs or any concerns, uh, which is what we expected, but we felt it was important to demonstrate this in the use in a specific uh, pediatric population. And then uh, we found evidence, and I'll add the caveat that this is a very small trial, uh, and, and um, when we broke it down into the sequence events, it's even smaller, but we found evidence of improved memory. And that's highlighted on the left panel in period one, where there's an increase in um, memory. I gotta move my... Uh, I just muted myself instead. Uh, I, I, uh, a word list learning recall where there's an increase over time uh, in the blue line, those patients treated with metformin uh, compared to those who weren't. And this was a significant effect. Um, we also saw an increase in working memory, again, in a small sample, but it was significant. Uh, and I, again, this is demonstrated in the period one box, the blue line showing an increase in items recalled in a working memory task uh, and no change, in fact, a bit of a decrease in the, in, in the participants who were, who were on placebo at the time. We also saw a decrease in response st speed, how quickly children uh, completed a series of attention and processing speed tasks. And this is again seen in the period one side um, uh, with the decrease in the blue line and, and, the, and the orange line staying stable. Um, I can get into the specifics. These were all sequence and carryover effects, and it's really complicated in a crossover trial. And in the in the presence of sequence and carryover effects, you are only uh, you, you really what you need to do is only look at the period one data. Um, uh, if people are interested in 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 those statistics, I'm happy to talk about it, but I won't but I won't get into the details uh, now. Uh, we also saw evidence uh, again in a small sample of. Uh, increased microstructure in the corpus callosum. Uh, and I highlight the uh, cellular data, the lineage data uh, on the very bottom right, because this is consistent with what Cindy found when she uh, did cell tracing in the corpus callosum in mice. Um, so what I hope uh, uh, I showed you here is that a clinical trial of metformin is feasible. Uh, in a small sample with excellent medication and procedural adherence. Um, it's tolerable with no major adverse events, but 
I think what was key about this paper wasn't so much the findings of the human study by themselves, because this was the small, small pilot trial, but the fact that there was synergy of findings between animal and human studies that we saw improved memory and working memory in both species. Uh, you know, you saw that we published this paper in Nature Medicine. Um, and um, I think that's what really intrigued the reviewers, that, that across species, we're seeing um, parallel findings. Uh, and in the uh, animal species, we know the mechanism. And so we can now make some good hypotheses about mechanism in the humans. But this was a very small pilot trial. And you see how I bolded that. So it doesn't answer the uh, question of efficacy. Uh, that needs to be uh, replicated in a larger trial with targeted outcomes. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight the, the funders and, and the people who um, provided uh, support here for this work before I continue. Uh, 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 and you can see their names there. Eric Buffet, a neuro-oncologist. Suzanne Lachlan, a, radio, a, a neuroradiologist. Cindy Morshead and Frieda Miller. Uh, um, stem cell biologist, Else Fearman's uh, 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 a physicist, Bradley McIntosh, a physicist, and our funding there. Um, and so uh, based on that work, we now have funding for a, uh, the actual efficacy trial. We needed that concurrent animal and human data to really justify to our funder and partners. And these, these were CCS, Canadian Cancer Society and CIHR in Canada, and, uh, and the Na National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia to conduct an efficacy trial. This is a trial that is going across Canada. You can see all the sites there from uh, coast to coast. Uh, also uh, four sites in Australia, um, uh, and COVID pandemic willing, I'll be traveling there to get us started. Mm, who knows, maybe that's going to be six months from now, uh, if we're lucky. Um, and our primary questions does, is, does metformin improve cognition uh, based on our findings from the pilot trial? Does metformin help white matter to grow in the corpus callosum based on our pilot trial? And then a number of exploratory questions there. Um, that we're going to carry out. And you'll notice the one on the bottom, does it affect animals and, huh, animals, males and, <laughs> animals and females, males and females differently based on the animal literature and the animal data that Cindy identified. We didn't have enough um, uh, individuals in our pilot trial to test the effects of sex assigned at birth. Uh, so, um, uh, this is where the animal studies are think are really important for us. Uh, this is going to be a, 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 a phase three randomized double blind placebo controlled parallel arm superiority trial uh, with um, really the question is whether in children aged seven to 17 years, 11 months, who've completed treatment for medulloblastoma, the brain tumor I told you about at the beginning, does metformin for 16 weeks, improve cognition relative to placebo for 16 weeks. And why metformin? Well, I think you would have got that sense from the talk, but just to reiterate, um, it's known, uh, we've, it's a known drug. Uh, the animal research has uh, really been the key here in making this rationale for turning on the stem cells. Uh, we've done the pilot trial, so this is now the second study, a and uh, we know the, what the side effects are, and they're tolerable. Um, there is uh, the uh, sample of, our, of the kids that are going to be participating, 140 kids, uh, and some of the other eligibility criteria. Um, and uh, here's the timeline. I just... In the interest of time, I thought I was, I thought I deleted these because uh, I wanted to get to here. Um, one uh, last point I wanted to make is when we consider our teams and when we consider multiple, uh, um, multidisciplinary uh, research, I think we need to start thinking uh, critically about stakeholders, patients and parents as 
a key discipline in the research that we do. Um, our goal in doing this clinical trial was to accelerate the direct engagement of patient families. You know, what we typically do in, in clinical research is we identify a problem and we want to establish, you know, the, the, the very rigorous methods uh, and grounding to uh, ensure we meet the means of statistical analysis, which is all critical for what we do. But uh, a pitfall is we often forget the human aspect uh, about the problems that we're trying to solve and the relevance to the communities or the stakeholders that we are working with in our research outcome, uh, with, uh, in terms of our research outcomes. And that's why I think it's, it's critical we engage uh, patients and families as, uh, I use the term, lived experience content experts um, in the development, implementation, analysis, and, and dissemination of the trial. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, when I was making my slides, uh, I added some extra things. Uh, I had a few slides uh, about um, the roles involved in this slide, but I think maybe what I did is I didn't actually uh, get them into this talk. So I'll just kind of say that while you see a nice picture of my lab there. The key to this, all of this work was the multidisciplinary nature of the research team. I hope you appreciated spanning from uh, neurobiologists who study, uh, you know, based mechanisms uh, up to people like me, a psychologist who study behavior. Uh, the research that we did traverses and spans all levels of analysis, multiple model systems, and, and involves multiple clinical uh, disciplines and, and is key for moving this work forward. And, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Don, for a, a really stimulating and interesting talk. Uh, what we like to do, I've got lots of questions, but what we like to do is open it up to the trainees first. So uh, please, trainees, uh, don't be shy. Unmute your microphone and ask your question. That's the easiest way. Or if you don't have that capability, I will monitor the chat box. So um, yes, please, well, let's take questions. Um, hi, it's uh, Jennifer Ryan. I uh, thank you very much for your talk, uh, Donald. It was very interesting. Um, I have uh, a more physiotherapy-based question because I'm a physiotherapist, and yes. I saw that you had physiotherapy. Oh, I think I saw it on your um, as one of your team members originally yes. uh, on the early slides. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, um, in your study, you had alluded to the effects of physical um, activity or exercise. And I was wondering if you were measuring that uh, solely from the perspective of the cognitive outcomes or if you were also looking at mobility outcomes uh, for these kids. Yeah, uh, it was mobility outcomes as well. Um, and uh, I think what happened <laughs> is I went along, I worked on my slides on Tuesday and I, and I think I, I ended up with the wrong slide deck. So I had a whole bunch of, uh, of slides on uh, the physical intervention that we did where physiotherapists are key to the work. So this is an entirely different study um, than the metformin study. <coughs> oh yeah, look, I just found, I found uh, my right slide deck right now. I, that the the uh, challenges of doing Zoom. I it's good up. to know. It's good for the trainees to know that the most accomplished among us screw up. Screw up. Here, I'm going to show you because I'm going to show you because damn, I had some good slides. But did you even notice until the end? That's the great thing. That's the other lesson. Uh, when you screw up, just keep powering forward. Um, and uh, um, uh, I ended up spending more time in this current talk on our metformin trial. I, had I done the right talk for you, I would have told you about um, the exercise trial that we did. Um, and and um, in that physiotherapy was key. Uh, uh, our physiotherapy partners, um, um, Janice Piscioni, uh, who's a master's physiotherapist, really uh, uh, um, uh, led that work. Uh, we have a publication from that work um, uh, looking at uh, um, the bot 
and looking at uh, uh, balance and improved balance following um, a treatment with a physical about a physical exercise. Um, and um, so while this kind of talk that I gave you was focused on uh, cognitive outcomes, certainly motor outcomes uh, are key to what we do. Uh, you know, I think we, and in, the, in a different trial that uh, we are doing that it wasn't part of either talk um, um, is actually with the um, colleagues at Florio um, Children's Hospital, uh, our rehab center, <coughs> um, Darcy fa <coughs> Failings, <coughs> where we are looking at motor outcomes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with metformin. And there are physiotherapy colleagues, are, it's actually metformin and physio at the same time. And there's that would be uh, analogous to that motor recovery we saw in the mouse models. I just swallowed something. I apologize. <clears throat> Hi, Any Dr. Other? Mavitt. Can I ask a question? Please. Um, so I um, I'm a pediatrician um, who does work in uh, pediatric clinical pharmacology. So I really really enjoyed your talk. So I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. I apologize to everyone in the group. My first one is, why do you think there was such a large number of potential participants who declined to take part in your study? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we, that's, that is the money question for us because um, it was less than about a 20% recruitment rate. What we've since found is in our other studies. So in, in um, the exercise study, we also only had about a 20% recruitment rate. And I think it just has to do with the burden for a lot of families. So we, when we looked at it and, and we looked at uh, the different characteristics of those who did and didn't participant, participate, you know, one of the big things was the, the uh, and we looked at the reasons that people elected not to participate, it had to do with the burden of the trial itself. Coming in for MRI scanning, um, coming in, uh, a lot of the kids and families didn't want to come in and have any more medical procedures uh, like uh, pokes, uh, even though this was um, a very minor, com relatively speaking, compared to their experience for treatment for cancer. But when we went and looked at the broader literature above of these neuro rehab um, types of studies, like in adults with stroke, um, generally uh, it, uh, a recruitment rate of about 20%, 25% of eligible participants is, is what we saw there as well. So I think it's just maybe a, a culture shift in, uh, in um, people's kind of appreciation of, of, of participating in this kind of work. That's uh, that's actually wonderful to note because like I I have been struggling a lot with my own recruitment during COVID, yeah. so I really kind of like um, appreciate to know what baseline expectations are for recruitment. Well, yeah, and and there's recruitment and then there's recruitment during COVID. <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. So all our studies, like, uh, so the CP metformin study that we're doing with Blurview Kids Rehab, uh, um, we've recruited three participants out of an, uh, a total of five. And we, there's tons of participants who say, yes, we want to do it, but we want to wait until after the pandemic. Yeah. Right. And, and this is actually, I think, a, in, in my, I'll put on my science leadership hat now. This is a key critical issue that we are going to have to talk with funders about is uh, participation of clinical research participants in research during COVID that can't be done virtually. Early on, we, we you know, everybody was saying, well, okay, we can pivot to pivot, we can pivot to virtual research. Uh, uh, and some research can, but we can't. Like we're doing MRI scanning um, and our site is open. We are open for research, but families are not coming in, um, which I understand, I totally understand. Um, and, and so, um, we're going to have a have to have a conversation nationally with funders and with uh, stakeholders across all pediatric hospitals. I think about um, how we re-engage uh, families in research post COVID and how um, our, our reporting to our funders and their um, 
long-term investment in our research is carried out given this gap. I know CIHR and various funders have, have, have provided kind of the emergency funds over time, but um, uh, I think that's a, a key issue. So sorry, I recognize we are after one o'clock. I just wanted to, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes and take questions, but I also don't want to keep people because I, I, I know I went too long. I'll ask my other question later. So okay. it can go to the next. And also please email me as well. I'm happy to take any emails from anybody. Uh, questions from someone else besides Renee for now? Getting a lot of thank yous in the chat and that people who clearly need to sign off, but John, it's really kind of you to hang on for a few more minutes. Maybe if, uh, if there are no other questions, Renee, feel free to go ahead with your second question. Oh, you're muted. Renee, you're on mute. Did this work? Yes, you're good now. Okay, great. Um, so my second question was when you decided to do um, a double placebo crossover trial, was that something that you decided to do even before knowing what the rate of recruitment was going to be? Yeah. Yes, we did. We decided that, and this was a philosophic decision because we felt uh, that uh, if we had a a, a, a relatively, relatively uh, innocuous, no medication is innocuous, but you know, a, a medication that had relatively mild AEs and we thought there was some benefit, we wanted to provide the opportunity for all participants to be exposed to the active medication. Um, you know, I, I think clinical trials, people philosophically could say, well, then if you think it's a, a benefit, why are you doing the clinical trial in the first place? Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't, so uh, it may be that the recruitment rate was lower uh, because people saw the burden of, the, of a crossover trial. They had to come in that many more times. Uh, um, and so we've since switched for the next trial to a parallel arm trial. The issue there we get though, and we have a significant uh, family stakeholder engagement uh, in, in this trial. We've gone to our research family advisory committee. We have a stakeholder engagement committee of made up of parents and patients for the trial. The issue there is everybody who's interested in the trial says, well, I yeah, but I want my child to be on the medication arm, not the placebo arm. <laughs> Uh, and so it's a bit of a catch-22, and it's, it, in this case, uh, we're sticking with a parallel arm because, number one, it's just much more easy to interpret the results of a parallel arm versus a crossover design trial. And uh, we are engaging our lived experience content expert uh, patients and families to give us strategies to reach out to families to, to help to explain them to them why uh, we need this design uh, and why, even if their child's on a placebo condition, why it's still uh, going to be a, a benefit, uh, of potential benefits. So, but it's a, it's a, it's an issue. Yeah. Uh, it's really insightful questions there, Renee, and, and, and helpful to all of us. I know Jennifer is running a, a clinical trial right now at Holden Blurview with uh, inpatient brain injury, and, and we're facing a lot of the same issues, even though we yeah. have literally a captive audience. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Don, I had a question for you specifically about uh, metformin and the the just the results across the board, both preclinically in terms of the sex differences between the mice, but then even just uh, in the uh, you know in the human in the child trials, uh, your outcomes. How do, how do you know how much metformin to give dosage wise and, mm -hmm. and, when, and when to give it? Yeah. And do you think that the sex differences in the animals could be driven by those types of variables? Um, whether it's by, you know, so the dosing that we started with in the human trial is based on the the therapeutic doses that have that the literature for treating either metabolic uh, conditions or obesity or diabetes in children um, has been used in the past. So that's so that was that's what that's based on. And then the animal studies actually work backwards as well in terms of the doses. They based it on 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 human um, studies. Um, 
so, but that's, I think, a key question going forward. What is the appropriate dosing? Because in terms of those, in those, do, in those studies, were the, were the it, primary outcomes cognition? No, no, they weren't. They weren't, right? So that's right. But that's kind of where we, uh, we started. Uh, the other issue is the duration, right? So how long do you give it for? So we started with 12 weeks. The reason we started with 12 weeks is because we did a, uh, an exercise study uh, that I was going to tell you about, but I used the wrong slide deck, um, uh, where we, it was 12 weeks in duration, and we saw neuroplastic changes uh, suggesting brain repair following physical exercise. So we thought that would be a good window to look at Menformin. In, uh, in the current trial, we've increased that to 16 weeks. And uh, there's, there's no reason, you know, I'm not, we're not suggesting 16 weeks of Metformin is going to, you know, yield uh, lifelong changes. I, I anticipate though there's probably going to have to be some kind of um, uh, consideration uh, in terms of the, of the long-term maintenance use of metformin, but we have to identify if there's a signal first. And so that's what we're doing in terms of whether uh, those, sorry. Uh, so kind of along the same lines in, in the mice work, uh, were the mice, uh, was it, was metformin used as an adjunct to like them practicing the, the Y maze, for example? No, no, like, no. Was the Y maze strictly an outcome measure? It was strictly an outcome measure. No, just doing yeah. the usual routine. Yeah. But I think you raise an interesting question, and this is actually what we're looking at at, uh, at Blurview with Darcy, is um, does metformin act in synergy with activity dependent act actions like mm -hmm. physiotherapy? So in the, in the CP trial with uh, Darcy, we are, uh, every child is getting an uh, active bout of physiotherapy uh, for 12 weeks, three times a week. Uh, actually, we're doing some of that remotely. Maybe you're aware of that. We just got REB approval to provide remote physio because of COVID. We're still not getting <laughs> participants uh, recruiting. Um, but there it's, uh, that's our basis. And then it's plus or minus placebo. And I think there's a lot of, uh, um, rationale to suggest that metformin is going to actually act better in the context of priming the uh, the microenvironment uh, that then will be driven by activity dependent activities like um, physiotherapy for brain repair. So, so I realize I do have to jump on to another call. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you um, for your time. I really appreciate.